So my name is uh, John Much. I'm the chair of the Canadian Society for Professionals and Disability Management uh, Board of Directors. And at this time, I'm coming to you from the unceded ancestral lands and the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, the Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And on behalf of the board, welcome to this special webinar, recognizing the significant achievement of disability management practitioners who successfully completed the certification process in the spring of 2023 and, in, and joined the global network of CDMP, CRT, WCs, professionals across 22 countries. Today, we will hear from progressive leaders in disability management and we'll close with the launch of a new video showcasing leadership in disability management. Now, I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Judy Geary is a volunteer at the not-for-profit board of director and retired vice president with Worker Integration WSIB, whom I've had the honor and privilege to learn from for so many years. She recently participated in the technical committee that created the Canadian Standard Association, CSA Disability Management Standard. So welcome, Judy. Yeah, thank you, John, and good morning, everybody from all parts of the country and uh, perhaps beyond. Um, I'm very happy to be here to celebrate the graduation of some newly minted certified disability management professionals. Congratulations to all of you on your wonderful and very important achievement. As John mentioned, you are part of an ever expanding group of professionals in disability management from all around the world. I understand that your Canadian graduating class this year numbers more than 70, with many more in international jurisdictions. Each and every year, the numbers grow as this valuable and meaningful credential becomes known and appreciated. CDMPs are not only improving the lives of persons with disabilities, they are contributing to making workplaces more inclusive and compassionate. Making a real and positive difference in the lives of others is ever so satisfying and motivational, and all of you are doing that. This credential began, as you may know, as a vision in British Columbia, Canada, almost 30 years ago. The vision was to reduce disability-caused poverty, enable productive and dignified lives for persons with disabilities, contribute to a civil and inclusive society, and honor the human rights of persons with disabilities. This was and is the vision of NIDMAR and now Pacific Coast University. I'm sure that you share this vision. Wolfgang's relentless advocacy and persuasion, <laughs> of which I was <laughs> subjected to many times <laughs> over the years, has evolved to where we are today, a professional credential supported by a research organization and a workplace health sciences university, recognized and valued around the world by agencies, service providers, and employers. I spent most of my 30 plus year career at the Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Board involved in some capacity or other always in vocational rehabilitation, return to work, labor market reentry, and towards the end, what we called work reintegration. It's the same general thing labeled differently over the years and labeled differently in different jurisdictions and by different organizations. You have become disability management professionals, another broader way of referring to the effort to manage the work reintegration process. I know that this process can be fraught with distrust in every direction, lack of planning, poor communication, poorly coordinated clinical care, important actions falling through the cracks, lots of time passing unnoticed 
and lack of follow through and accountability on the part of service providers and workplace parties. I've operated within several return to work or VR strategies over my uh, 30 plus year career. None of them worked particularly well. The involved staff were dedicated and the intent was always to improve outcomes for injured and ill workers. Often it was also to lower costs, but something was missing. At dis as disability management professional professionals, you understand that both the objectives to improve outcomes and to lower costs can be achieved with a research informed program whose logic ties directly to lasting work outcomes and with supportive policies and evaluation metrics. My last assignment at WSIB was to design a work reintegration strategy and program that would address serious financial satisfaction and outcome problems in a badly broken system. I had already learned a lot about what Canadian research tells us how best to manage a case with a return to work focus that includes worker involvement at every step. But during that assignment, I also canvassed worldwide best practices. Consistently, experts and researchers from around the world reported on the multiple complexities of the work reintegration process and the expertise and knowledge required to manage it well. It's clear that who is managing the process should not be left to amateurs nor to chance. Clients' family stability, financial well being, mental and physical health, and sometimes literally their very lives are at stake. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, among others, strongly recommended that the field of work reintegration be professionalized. What a great idea. And here in Canada, were the best possible credentials, comprehensive and fully validated, the certified disability management professional and certified return to work coordinator designations. So we joined forces with NIDMAR, NIDMAR to credential a number of key staff and opened up the possibility of gaining a credential to anyone on staff who cared to continue their education in this field. As employers and service providers learned about our new program design, which required credentialed staff in our organization, many of them followed suit with requiring CDMPs for their own disability management programs and services. And that uh, movement has continued to evolve and to grow. This credential will stand you in good stead whether you're looking for a new career opportunity with a different employer or already working on the front line, working in management or in a senior role, designing programs and policies. The knowledge you have is helpful on every level. You now know best practice in both individual case management, service delivery and in program design you are well-placed to directly or indirectly lead your organization to better results for their employees or clients and for their bottom line. Knowledge in the DM field continues to evolve with changes in the working world and with new research. You're lucky to have access to some of the most up-to-date and relevant continuing education via NIDMAR and Pacific Coast University for workplace, workplace Health Sciences. I encourage you to continue your education as professionals must, and I wish you and your clients the best possible future. Thank you so much for your caring service towards disabled persons, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judy. Words of wisdom.
At this time, um, we're going to show a video uh, sharing the differences and challenges between the UK and Canada. Graham Halsey is the Executive Director for the International Disability Management Security Council for UK, Ireland. He oversaw the original delivery of the CDMP award into the UK in 2006 and led the introduction of NIDMAR education certification and audit process in the UK. It's lovely to join you here today through the technical wizardry of Zoom. My name is Graham Halsey and I deliver the CDMP training and oversee the exam process here in the UK. For the past five years, we've seen roughly 100 individuals challenge the exam each year. That is primarily due to the major investment by Scottish Government to train 300 health and employability staff. But other insurance and rehabilitation companies use the CDMP designation as a standards mark that set them apart from their competition and assist them to achieve government contracts. In August of this year, we hosted an awards day ourselves for students who had successfully completed the course and passed the exam. And for many, it was the first time they'd met apart from that horrendous day in May when they were in fact sitting the exam. And I, of course, was relaxing at the front of the building, working with a team of invigilators, telling them everything will be fine. For most of them, it was fine. I accept that they had a brilliant course facilitator, but that, of course, is boasting. Aside from their dedication and willingness to challenge and later accept some of the concepts that were absolutely amazing, I'm sure this would be the same with you. And it really is my privilege to congratulate you and share with you some of the work that is happening here in the UK. 2023 saw us being able to boast by accident a running of the online training day alongside a filming of a Bollywood movie and the cohort being given a commentary of events from one of our students. The concepts of disability management mixed with a car chase based in Glasgow, but pretending to be in India was for me certainly a first time. The awards event near Edinburgh at the end of August allowed all of the students to meet face to face. And this in itself brought its own challenges as we lost the company of our pets that many got to know really well through the course. And indeed, I was tempted to bring along certificates of attendance for both cats and dogs, as I think they will now become experts in disability management in their own right. Like Canada, there are courses run across the whole of the UK, and we run some face to face and some virtually. Courses tend to start in September and run through to the exam date in May. And last year, we ran eight separate cohorts. <clears throat> it feels so long ago when we first met and started to talk about the concepts of the CDMP role, what it looks like here and what the National Institute of Disability Management and Research offered by way of an alternative in helping introduce people into keeping them in work and helping them return to work. And it's fascinating to see the difference some of the concepts of the course make in day to day work. I think it's sensible to point out that there are two main differences between our two countries that affect the role of the CDMP. In the UK, there is no workers' compensation. So any return to work has to be negotiated and agreed because there is no legislation to enforce it. Equally, employers do not have to engage in the process and nor do employees. So the CDMP role has to include negotiation and no little persuasion as one of its core skills. And the NHS provision in the in the UK, where treatment is free at the point of need for all citizens. This, of course, is a world class standard, but does cause, cause huge issues of waiting lists and timely access to services in a system that is struggling desperately to cope with the demands placed upon it. In lieu of this, I remember discussing with the groups, what are the things that we need to consider when helping someone return to work or enter the workplace? One of the key ones was what's in it for the employer. And this, of course, has not changed. We need to work closely with employers at all stages to get their buy in, get their support, their understanding, because unlike the CDMPs, most of them do not have training or understanding in the needs of people with long term health problems or disabilities. 
but we continue to make huge expectations of them when we talk of the need to make reasonable accommodations. And when things go wrong, how often do we say the employer didn't do their part? We train students in the concepts of disability management. They sit and pass a challenging exam. And then what? Some will go back to their existing job and continue, but the role of the CDMP can have influence in a number of places and a world of opportunity can open up for you. A CDMP can work within an HR team of an organisation helping to manage sickness absence, reporting directly to senior management on the rate of absence, the cost of absence, on the success or otherwise of policies on the influence their interventions are having. Indeed, our colleagues in the Shetland Islands, north of the whole mainland of the UK, in fact, nearer to Norway than it is to the UK, are currently adopting this approach and following their attendance on the course are making huge differences to the way they manage their absence and disability management processes. A CDMP can work within the NHS where it can be more challenging to influence change. But we have examples of return to work teams being successfully set up both following internal and external referrals. And only last week I saw a publication from a large NHS establishment in Forth Valley near to Edinburgh talking of the success of their team, several whom, of whom have achieved the CDMP designation. And similarly, teams in other parts of Scotland around Glasgow, the south coast of Ayr, Lanarkshire, which is in central Scotland, and Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is the largest NHS employer in Scotland itself, having all adapted their practice in some way to incorporate a greater work focus in their service. This is truly inspirational and a real change in what we expected to see. A CDMP can work in an employability area and bring their skills to those who have been out of work for long periods and support both the individual and the employer who is probably quite unsure of what is expected of them. And as we move forward, this will fit in well with the Scottish Government commitment of a project called No One Left Behind. We now have excellent examples of the existing individual placement and support, IPS services being enhanced when teams, including the health professionals, all use CDMP as the common language. Similarly, this helps engagement with the teams in job centres. We are seeing a number of organisations who seek government funded return to work contracts using CDMP as a standard that sets them apart from their competitors. And in particular, a service that is growing in the UK called the Mental Health Support Service. It covers the whole of the United Kingdom and it now insists that every practitioner employed must have this designation. Just 12 months ago, there were six practitioners with the designation. By the end of 2024, the target is 125. Real insight into the value of this organization puts the designation and the way they see the need for their workforce to be standards led into perspective. As a point of interest, this service rapidly grows. And in June of this year, the team accepted 973 referrals from individuals seeking support with their mental health and looking to stay in work, up 50% in six months. By October, this had risen to 1,126. Word is clearly getting around about the CDMP designation, as I have now been personally contacted three times by MPs from the Scottish Parliament asking for details of CDMPs in their constituencies to help with return to work questions. In discussion, it's become clear the designation is being talked of within Parliament as a qualification of value. A CDMP can work within an insurance setting, and many of the largest income protection insurers in the UK now insist on this designation for their claims and rehabilitation teams. Recent reports are showing these teams lead the way in helping individuals stay in and return to work, with success rates of above 65% and some, in some cases approaching 85%. If we consider the influence that the CDMP can now have on organisations, individuals and workplaces, 
the entry to work and return to work and maintenance in work is not difficult to manage. Imagine the influence they can have in supporting the government's initiatives of reducing the disability employment gap, which has remained stubbornly difficult to move over recent years and has actually risen again since COVID-19. We should also think of the problem of these economic inactive individuals on the benefit they and indeed society would gain from the skilled input of teams of individuals all talking the same language, whether it be health, benefits or employment. The argument does seem compelling. Let me take you to a small island south of the coast of England, nearer in fact to France, but it forms a group known as the Channel Islands. It has a population of 100,000 people and is famously known internationally as a tax haven. Indeed, this island has members of the government whose sole task it is to attract billionaires to live there. <clears throat> Despite being part of the United Kingdom, Jersey does not have access to the National Health Service and their benefit structure is completely different to the ones seen within the mainland meaning that people have to pay to see their doctors and their law states that if they ha have or are in receipt of sick notes, they're not allowed to undertake any work activity. And this is, of course, includes return to work practices, graduated return to work or transitional work programmes. The government of Jersey, after consultation, has decided on a pilot scheme initially moving quickly to consolidate its system to introduce early intervention and support for return to work for conditions such as mental health and musculoskeletal injuries. CDMP will be at the heart of the training for both health, HR, employability staff on the island and the government is supporting this initiative wholeheartedly. The challenge will be to move from a medically based model to a biopsychosocial model, but there is a real desire for change. Within a year, the project will move on to long-term benefits and also focus on how employers' needs can be met as return to work becomes a focus, not just paying benefits. So to you, the class of 2023, I once again congratulate you and I look forward to staying in touch with you all. And I'd like to issue you with three challenges that I have given to the students in the UK for the forthcoming year. Number one, never accept being told that an individual can't come back to work until they're 100% fit. We can always look at accommodations and most people really do want to go back to work. Number two, remember to try and support the employer. Few managers sitting in their office were employed to look after someone who is just recovering from mental illness or indeed a broken leg or maybe cancer. More likely they were employed to do the job with the title that it says on their door. They too can be scared of what an individual entering or returning to the workplace with a health problem or a disability can look like. And number three, remember the days when we talked about accommodation costs. Here in Scotland, accommodation as an average costs 80 pounds and there is government support. The cost to hire somebody just to get to the point of offering a letter is £3,000. I'm sure the rates are similar in Canada. It is actually a no-brainer to look at how someone can enter, remain or return to work without the need for an employer to go down the recruitment route. I really hope you enjoy the remainder of your day. Get to know some of your colleagues and stay in touch. The experience shared is invaluable. Thank you. Wow, that was uh, quite powerful. Thanks to Graham and his words. So um, at this time, uh, we're going to introduce the newly certified CDM peers, the CRTWCs, and we have a bit of a, a presentation that we have to do that.
Congratulations, everyone. Well done. So at this time, um, we want to introduce Wolfgang, bringing a lived experience and dedicated leadership in improving return to work outcomes for disabled workers. Wolfgang Zimmerman is the executive director of NINMAR and president of Pacific Coast University for Workplace Health and Science. So Wolfgang. Great, uh, thanks a lot. Um... Uh, John, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to just say a, a few words, and uh, certainly uh, listening to uh, Judy of uh, literally decades gone by. A great pleasure working together, trying to move this agenda forward. I mean, and of course with with you, John, um, as well. It's uh, it's a uh, it's been a, a collective effort as we try to uh, make a bit of a difference. And uh, it's those in the, those uh, few moments that. Um, that I have, uh, I uh, you know, it, it's tremendously gratifying to see um, what has uh, what has developed because uh, when uh, when I got hurt uh, in a logging accident and I'm dating myself here, some 46 years ago, there was literally no support. We didn't have duties to accommodate. We didn't have ILO standards. We didn't have ESA return to work guidelines. And the work that um, all of you are are doing is is incredibly important in in terms of trying to make a difference, particularly as we today realize the um, what we call the one plus one reality, uh, which is uh, starting to be recognized at all levels, and that is really the fact that uh, the latest uh, data indicates that if you've been out of work as a result of uh, disability you have a one percent or less chance on average of uh, of ever going back um, to work so uh, this is really uh, tremendous to um, to see that that uh, all of you will be able to to make a difference and I guess the part that uh, that I see where this is most is important is really understanding and impacting what we uh, See and hear so often in terms of the poverty is the fact that uh, homelessness and housing challenges and rising costs are front and center in the media in in many days. Uh, the issue of um, looking at a Canada a disability benefit and that um, you are you have now the professional skill and the competence to make a difference from for individuals, whether or not they end up on the social security system, which by default means that um, individuals live in poverty. And when we consider that 80% of um, all mental and physical health impairments happen during somebody's working life, you are the one who in many cases will stand between the individual continuing to maintain um, equitable opportunities at all level, I've been fortunate uh, to have been able to carry on working over the past many decades because of the support of the employer and the support of the union, which was absolutely uh, pivotal in this um, in this um, regard. Um, one of the key things is, of course, as many of you are aware, is that the uh, and this builds on uh, Graham's excellent comments and and his his leadership that the Belgian government as of January 1st last year requires uh, a CDMP designation for anybody that works in return to work across across uh, Belgium and that individuals had from the start of the introduction or when the legislation became law on January 1st, 22, they had two years to obtain that. And um, in a similar vein, in terms of the opportunities and the <clears throat> requirements building on what's happening in other jurisdictions outside of the UK and Belgium, this is the same process that's underway uh, currently in um, Malaysia and uh, some of the other ASEAN countries. We have an initiative uh, underway that's funded, uh, fully funded by the federal government, the provincial government, where um, individuals who are applying for disability social assistance can um, have access to a CDMP in order to identify potential creative solutions, as I always call, um, 
the, the three C's of effective disability management is which is creativity, collaboration, and commitment. This is a very uh, unique um, initiative under the leadership of the former Minister for Social Security uh, and, um, and uh, Poverty Reduction uh, here in BC, Shane, Shane uh, Simpson. And is, is really completely aligned in, in trying to support individuals that are at risk of losing their job, don't have any other structure to uh, draw on, and you have to be a, um, a CDMP in order to qualify for participating uh, in this effort. And you can expect to hear from uh, the project uh, director, Bill Dyer, over the next uh, little while, whether or not this is something you may want to be uh, interested in, in participating in. Certainly, the government of um, Belgium and other jurisdictions, as, as Graham mentioned, have identified as part of a national policy conversation that return to work is a national health care priority, the impact and the potential that effective return to work um, can have um, on the, um, on the uh, individuals. So you've done a, a tremendous job. You've got a tremendous role um, in, um, in, in front of you in terms of trying to make a difference for an individual who has acquired a mental or physical health um, impairment of um, being able to be equitable member of, of our society. In terms of the uh, development uh, back in um, 2018, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had signed an agreement with the Inter-American Conference on Social Security, CISS, which was founded in 1942. It is a technical and specialized international organization which has the objective of promoting the development of social protection and security in the Americas. As a result of um, the impact of uh, COVID, um, we, um, uh, the, uh, the discussions ground a bit to a halt. The uh, CISS is headquartered in Mexico City, is part of the uh, uh, UN structure and UN United Nations um, uh, family. And um, a few months ago, uh, we started uh, re-engaging with them at their request because the uh, whole notion of disability inclusion and recognizing that employers who don't accommodate their own employees will never adopt a functioning disability inclusion strategy. Uh, CS has re-engaged with us and they are now committed. And CSS involves 91 countries in the Americas which is South America, Central America, North America, as well as CARICOM, which is the Association of Caribbean uh, States, towards adopting our education program, as well as the CDMP as a desired professional uh, standard. So what that will mean as part of our uh, detailed uh, discussions that we've had recently with the leadership uh, of CSS is that in addition to Malay and French and Dutch and uh, German, um, the uh, education program as well as the CDMP will then be available in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, so you can expect to see a dramatic expansion going forward uh, as a result of this. It's very concrete. It's part of the uh, next um, next year's uh, working plan of CSS that was formally approved. So you can see a dramatic expansion uh, in this area. And we'll probably come back to some of you who may be interested in helping, particularly in the Caribbean, some of those states in implementing disability uh, management uh, programs. Again, my congratulations on a tremendous achievement. You are able to make a huge difference in the lives of individuals with disabilities. And I certainly hope that um, 
will have the privilege and I'll have the privilege of meeting many of you in person at um, IFDM 2024, which will take place from September 15th to 17th at the uh, Western Bayshore Hotel in Vancouver. Having said that, um, I'll hand this back to, uh, to, uh, into John's uh, capable hands. Thank you, Wolfgang. And thanks for the plug for IFDM 2024 in Vancouver. Um, well done. So at this time, I want to introduce Jennifer Lan, who brings years of experience from the workers' compensation system and is a disability management consultant instructor at the PCU WHS. And her topic today is the BC WSIB return to work obligation which come into effect January 1, 2024. So we're all curious and want to hear about this, Jennifer. Over to you. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I have to say uh, what an honor it is to be here. I mean, I get so excited when I hear about all the new people coming into this industry. Um, as John mentioned, I've, I've been around a long time. I think uh, I went through the NIDMAR program in 1995. And so I've followed Wolfgang and Nidmar and PCU for all of my career. And the changes that I've seen have been dramatic. Um, back in 1995, it was common to get medical reports saying, not 100%. Come see me back when you're feeling better, and then I'll write you a note. And people were still having bed rest after low back strains. It's a very different world we're in now. And Nidmar and PCU have just followed the curve and, and led us down the path that it's important. This work that we do and that all of you people, uh, it's important we make a difference. I always consider myself actually a, a worker bee rather than a, a leader because I get the most satisfaction out of really getting down and understanding what it is we do, how we do it, how we can do it better, what the research says. So as I'm instructing uh, at PCU, the course on Bill 41, the changes to the workers' compensation legislation, I've never seen more engagement from our BC and across Canada students. Because this is another opportunity for us to make a, a change, to make things better, with respect to return to work. So thank you for giving me 15 minutes. I'll try to stick to my time. I know we have a busy packed morning. Anytime I talk about legislative change, and I did spend 25 years at WorkSafe, so I have done lots of legislative change in my career. It's really important to think about the intent of the legislation. And we have uh, our honorable minister of labor, Harry Baines, and this is what he said when he introduced the changes. These changes are to ensure that people who are injured on the job know that there is a WCB system that meets their needs. This legislation recognizes the benefits of injured workers maintaining their connection to the workplace. It talks about the cooperation of all parties. And specifically, it speaks to the importance of a timely return to work. Philosophically, that is exactly what all of us were hoping to hear. Because any, and I know that many of the, my colleagues on this call are working in jurisdictions in Canada where there is legislation that's been in place. Um, I think BC is, I think there are eight other provinces and territories that are further ahead than us. So this is a huge step forward for us. The Bill 41 contains seven amendments. And this is the last one that's being implemented, as John said, on January 1st, 2024. And so there are two key duties associated with this legislation. The duty to cooperate, and I love that term, and the duty to maintain employment for an injured worker. So I'll start with duty to cooperate. There are three key components, in my opinion, about this. Contacting each other, as soon as practicable. That talks about workers, injured workers, reaching out to the employer. Employers reaching out to their injured worker when it's practicable. And they didn't define two days, two weeks, because it really will depend on the circumstances. If somebody's had a very severe injury, 
nobody wants to be re nobody wants to be contacted by their employer on day one. I think there has to be respect and consideration for what will work best for the injured worker. I think that the second one is that duty to cooperate is more than just communicating. It specifically speaks to the need to main, to, main, to identify modified duties. And then it also speaks to the employer must, and I love that word must whenever I see it in policy, must make available modified work and the worker must not unreasonably reject offer. So what this means is that the duty to cooperate is a very balanced approach. It's not putting all the responsibility on the employer, it's acknowledging that the worker also has a responsibility to cooperate in this process. And there are penalties if this cooperation doesn't occur. But more importantly, it actually provides direction on how best to support return to work. And that's, I think, what for me is probably the most exciting thing about this legislation is it talks about the, the role of the worker. They know what jobs are available they can have the ability to identify suitable work. And it puts the onus on the employer to make that work available. Because I think every single, all 242 of us on this call know that it's most important to get back to work as soon as possible. That prevents all the, the things that Wolfgang was talking about in terms of poverty, in terms of impacts on family. So this, these legislative changes will enshrine that. And then policy will be developed. And right now it's only draft policy. So we don't have all the answers. And I'm teaching a course right now at PCU on this. And we do have to say, all, like we don't know how it will unfold, what the, what the penalties will look like. There are currently penalties in place for both workers when they don't accept modified duties. And I'm hoping that the policy that gets developed and enacted with respect to the duty to cooperate takes that very reasonable approach. And that's certainly what WorkSafe has been saying. They're gonna take a very cautious approach. It's education, it's consultation. We all know this is the right way forward and we need to work together. We need to cooperate to get to the point where we get our, worker, our injured workers back to work as fast and safe as possible. The duty to maintain is certainly generating a lot of discussion. This is a duty to maintain employment and it requires an employer with 20 plus workers to maintain employment if the worker has been continuously employed for 12 months. So what I've been hearing from people in our, in our classes is this is, you know, it, it might appear to be a little bit overwhelming for employers, this is now a legal responsibility. However, when you look at the way the legislation has been worded, it applies in BC to work to employers with 20 plus employers. In the draft policy documents that WorkSafe's released, they, they feel that this will apply to about just under 5% of the employers in this province. So the actual legal obligation is limited in terms of the employer because we have such a large pool of small employers in this province. However, what it does is it reinforces the importance of maintaining employment. It, it's going to change the culture with our whole employer community, I would expect, because what it does is it lays out how important it is to keep work available. The second component of duty to maintain is that you have to maintain employment to the point of undue hardship. Now, everybody on this call has probably heard about undue hardship. In the past, that has been either provincially through human rights or federally through Canadian human rights regulated, meaning that WorkSafe wouldn't have had the ability to enforce undue hardship. Now it's enshrined in WorkSafe legislation. So WorkSafe BC will actually enforce, enforce this now. So from my perspective, that's a very significant change. It will allow us to actually encourage those employers that aren't actually directly affected by this legislation that this is the standard 
And for those large employers that are directly affected by this regulation or legislation, there is an obligation. So what does undue hardship mean? It means too difficult, too costly, or unsafe. That is a very high threshold. And I expect that it will result in many, many more individuals being returned back to work with some of these large employers that may in the past have been a little less keen to engage in that return to work process. The third component of duty to maintain employment is they've introduced the return to your pre-injury work, the alternative or comparable work, and then suitable work. So suitable work is a whole new term for WorkSafe BC, and they're defining it meaning safe, productive, and consistent with the worker's functional abilities. So it doesn't have to be the pre-injury job. Alternative work would be comparable work, but now there's going to be this responsibility to really look at new work. What else have you got that does meet this worker's functional abilities? So that's a step in return to work that we've not had in BC before. So again, it, it's exciting. Do we, do we really know what it's gonna mean? Not quite yet, but it does obviously give us the opportunity to really engage with our employers in this province and talk about functional ability. What is meaningful work? What can we potentially look to? So with duty to maintain, there is a, a penalties. If the employer does fail to comply, uh, for example, if an employer terminates within terminates an injured worker within six months after providing them with suitable employment, WorkSafe BC can now make payments to the worker for up to a year. So this again is very new within the workers' compensation system. So after somebody has meet, reached maximal medical recovery, normally that is when wage loss replacement benefits would conclude. At this stage now, if the employer is not willing to accommodate, WorkSafe will maintain an injured worker on benefits for up to a year while they do some fairly significant work with the employer to try to achieve a return to work. So this, in my opinion, is a pretty significant step and it's a security, I mean, financial stress on injured workers has got to be one of the most damaging aspects of being disabled. Being able to maintain, maintain somebody on benefits for a year will really relieve some of the pressure. And I think this is a tremendous, tremendous step forward. So in summary, what do these duties do for BC? An employer must, and that must word is fabulous, make available modified work and the worker must not unreasonably reject that offer. An employer must, to the point of undue hardship, make changes to the work or workplace necessary to accommodate a worker. And I haven't done a lot of research into what the other jurisdictions are doing, but as we go down this path in BC, I'm gonna be reaching out to my colleagues and all of you on this call and start learning how we can help ensure that this new legislation operationalizes the way we need it to, the way that the intent of our government and the intent of this legislation created this path forward. So that's that's kind of my very brief overview. Again, these uh, there are lots of details. Uh, duty to cooperate will apply for all claims with the date of injury up to going back to 2022. So people that are still in the system will now have an obligation going forward. For duty to maintain employment, it goes back one year. So there is going to be lots of changes right away. There's going to be the need to start for us as in disability management, for us to start thinking about these changes and thinking about how it's going to affect our return to work programs with our employers how we can really look to what the intent is and how we can work with WorkSafe BC to make sure that our workers get the support and the benefits that they're entitled to. So, you know, again, please reach out to me if you wanna discuss this further. I, I am so excited at this stage. I think in my career, this is one of the most positive steps forward in helping supporting return to work that I've seen. So. 
thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share what I think, and I'll pass it back to John. Thank you, Jennifer. Very interesting topic. Uh, good luck. I think there's a lot of educational opportunities for you coming in 2024 um, with our members for sure. So thank you. At this time, uh, I want to introduce an old uh, colleague of mine, uh, old, I use the term lightly, uh, Rodney Cook is a safety professional and vice president of workplace health and safety services at the WSIB in Ontario. And he's going to give us an overview of the WSIB Health and Safety Excellence Program and SIP grant initiative. So welcome, Rod. Thanks so much, John. And I guess I'll start off by saying I've been called worse, so um, this, uh, that's okay. And it's it's coming from from a great person. So, um, listen. First, I want to say good morning and congratulations to all of you. Uh, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you today as you on, embark on your journey and your careers in disability management. The field you've chosen. It's just filled with exciting challenges and opportunities, and particularly in uh, our work environment that's rapidly evolving. In the next couple of minutes, I want to discuss some of the current challenges that you as disability management professionals might face in today's society. And as I speak, I want you to think about how you can help address some of these emerging issues. First and foremost, I'll start with psychological safety in the workplace as it continues to be a pressing concern. Ensuring that employees feel safe and comfortable to disclose any health conditions or disabilities that they may have is crucial. And we must create an environment where they feel supported without fear of stigmatization and discrimination. Encouraging open conversations and providing um, resources for mental and emotional well-being will help bring a more inclusive and supportive workplace. Your role will be to help people with mental health challenges thrive in all, aspect, all aspects of their lives, both at work and at home. At the WSIB, we strongly support our people and our clients' mental health. We have a dedicated team of professionals in place to support people with mental stress injuries at work. But of course, our primary goal is preventing harm from occurring in the first place by helping businesses implement strong psychological health and safety programs at work. Equity, diversity, and inclusion are principles that should guide our every action. As disability management professionals, it's our responsibility to guarantee equal opportunity for all individuals, regardless of their background or abilities. We need to be advocates for creating inclusive workplaces that celebrate diversity, accommodate varying needs, and provide fair opportunities for career advancement. By embracing the unique strengths of all employees, we foster a more inclusive and dynamic work environment. Accessibility for people with special needs is another critical challenge we face. It's our duty to ensure that workplaces are barrier-free and accessible to individuals with mobility, sensory, and cognitive disabilities. This involves not only physical modifications, but also fostering a culture of accommodation. Implementing assistive technologies, offering flexible work arrangements, and providing reasonable accommodations can make a significant difference in the lives of employees with special needs. At the WSIB, our return to work specialists and health and safety consultants assist employers in identifying suitable accommodations to help keep people at work. And lastly, the rapidly evolving world at work is continually, continuously presenting new opportunities and challenges. Technological advancements, the rise of remote work, and increasing diversity, diverse work arrangements demand that disability management professionals stay adaptable and up to date. As professionals in this field, we must continually learn and grow, incorporating new, new tools, methodologies, and best practices to meet every changing need for employees and organizations. So the challenges we face are immense, but so are the opportunities to make a positive impact. By prioritizing psychological safety, championing equity and diversity, more inclusive and supportive workplaces for individuals of, of all abilities can be achieved. 
your dedication to this field is invaluable. And I'm confident that each one of you has the potential to make a profound difference in the lives of employees and the success of organizations. So thinking about the challenges and opportunities I've just talked about, I wanna spend a little bit of time on the various initiatives that we're pursuing at the WSIB. As I mentioned, our primary goal is to promote health and safety to Ontario businesses and prevent workplace injuries and illnesses from occurring. Because as you know, the impact of work-related injury and illness can be devastating, not only on the injured or ill person, but their family, their business, and those that they work with. So what are we doing? Firstly, and what I'm really proud of is our flagship program, our Health and Safety Excellence Program. This voluntary program incentivizes businesses to implement health and safety programs in their workplace. And by doing so, they can earn rebates from their WSIB premiums. I talked about that many of our health and safety consultants are CDMPs, and the program has over 39 different health and safety topics, each a component of a health and safety management system with distinct return to work and accommodation topics. Since 2019, the program has touched over 4,000 businesses and, and we represents 1 million workers who now work for organizations who are signed up for our Health and Safety Excellence Program. And we've provided over $45 million in rebates in helping create safe workplaces. What's particularly helpful about this program is the additional support for smaller businesses. We know that smaller businesses often do not have a foundational health and safety background or might not have a particular adept program around disability management. That's why we're helping more small businesses take part in the program by offering further financial assistance. We've doubled the rebates in Ontario for organizations to sign up, for small organizations to sign up for the Health and Safety Excellence Program. I also want to note that we've heavily promoted NIDMAR and continuing education and disability management through our outreach sessions. Over the last couple of years, we promoted NIDMAR grant opportunities to over to hundreds of businesses and have over 4,000 uh, employees who have uh, enrolled in the, in the education program. Another service we've recently launched is what we call our priority business initiative. These are for high need businesses. Through this program, we aim to find tailored solutions to businesses that might not be doing well. They may have higher lost time injury rates or may have high durations. An early success story from the uh, pro a priority business initiative. We were able to connect them to the Health and Safety Excellence Program, and we partnered with NIDMAR and did an assessment of the organization. And that business has achieved an impressive 30% drop in lost time injury rates. Finally, at the WSIB, we know that the workplace health and safety isn't always easy to find, particularly for smaller businesses. Ontario's health and safety system is a network of government agencies, making it sometimes difficult to know where to go for what. Ontario's health and safety system, uh, we've, we've brought together a program called One Window that better connects organizations to where they need to go and making it easier for them to find their health and safety association. So we can automatically provide businesses that are registered with free membership to their industry-specific health and safety association. We also provide tailored consultation to newly registered businesses who might be at high risk or needing further health and safety support. These are just some of the initiatives that we're doing at the WSIB to better connect businesses, to improve their disability management and return to work outcomes, and to prevent injuries from happening in the first place. So I'd say to this class of graduates, there is many opportunities for you to get involved and to make a difference. It's exciting to have uh, such, um, such amazing uh, programming through, the, through PCU and Mid NIDMAR that can really help us improve outcomes across this nation. So thank you very much. And John, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Rod.
thanks for giving us the update on the great work that's going on at the WSAB and, and the corporation together. Um, wonderful. Next, uh, we will hear from Trevor Jansen. And Trevor is the video director, producer, and editor with Staggering Media. He has a video premiere for us. So over to you, Trevor. All right. So uh, thank you for the introduction. And hello, everyone, and congratulations. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with Nidmar, creating videos and still images uh, since 2018. Uh, in the spring of this year, Wolfgang asked me to help communicate the CDMP designation as the gold standard and ultimately raise the number of people like yourselves practicing in the field of disability management. So we took a deep dive into the motives for people to develop their career, put in the work and pursue the CDMP designation. And we came up with three overarching themes, the theme of leadership, opportunity, and impact. In talking about leadership, we found people who wanted to hold the highest and most widely recognized designation in the field of disability management around the world. And this is the story of ensuring compliance and best practices for the employer and ensuring that systems are functioning as designed while making sure that it is not at the expense of people. The value of opportunity, both personal and professional, pointed towards a growing field that offers diverse work environments. Uh, the many career opportunities open to a CDMP make for many paths to prosperity. And the, the stories of impact that a CDMP can have are incredibly touching. Through rigorous implementation of support and early intervention and effective occupational rehab, your focus on return to work reverberates far beyond the workplace. I want to say a special thank you to the three CDMPs who embody these three values with their personal stories. Thank you to Rebecca Chow, Vicki Naseby, and Maggie Sun. Without their amazing dedication to the field of disability management, this project would not have been possible. Um, as we watch these stories together, I hope you will all recognize a part of yourselves in each story and feel inspired about your future working in disability management. So without further ado, let's watch these three CDMP stories about leadership, opportunity, and impact. In 2019, the Accessible Canada Act passed into law, as have other provincial accessibility standards. The goal is to create a barrier-free Canada by 2040. We have a long way to go, and we're going to need new leaders to get us there. My career in disability management started at a federal agency where I got a close and personal look behind the scenes at how disability management professionals approach ill and injured employees, manage their recovery and absence, and enable them to come back to work in a safe, productive, and meaningful way. Now, working in a strategic leadership support role, my job is like walking a balance beam. I need to be aware of various stakeholders and their best interests at different levels. My job is to ensure a balanced and fair approach. It's about making sure bureaucratic systems provide the functions as designed and not at the expense of people. Hello. The real work, the challenge I enjoy, is in doing things right and doing the right thing. I'm constantly asking myself, what is the experience of a disabled employee? Are all the options on the table? Are we being compassionate? How are we resolving conflicts? And do our solutions go beyond the rigidity of policy? Having a CDMP designation gives me a broad perspective. I see the employee experience from end to end and anticipate where conflicts and barriers will arise. Most importantly, I can see beyond the deliverables where a disabled employee maintains their connection to the workplace. Nitmar says the gold standard with its CDMP designation. Just to qualify for an exam requires a wide breadth of experience and education. But once you meet those qualifications, you're prepared beyond return to work and case management roles. In this growing field, HR departments are searching for the right people who can assure the quality of work to be done. They also need to have confidence that your foundation is solid to meet the challenges of changing policy, technology, and legislation. The recent pandemic perfectly illustrated 
how industry can be affected by rapidly shifting workplace conditions that need to be guided by frontline knowledge of equity issues. At the end of the day, it's about making sure our disability management systems are working the way they're designed to be, and we embrace people as people. There were over a quarter million lost time occupational injury claims in Canada in 2019, which represents only about 30% of the total injuries. That is a lot of people who need support while they focus on recovery. Growing up, my dad worked in the field of occupational health and safety. He was a big influence on me to become interested in ergonomics, safety, and how to set people up for success when they return to work after an injury or illness. As a CDMP helping people with their return to work, many worry that they will be looked down upon for not being 100% right away. That's just not true. Pace yourself is what I've told them. If you can only do 50% to start, then that is your new 100% and you should be proud when you achieve it. There is always uncertainty in returning to work, but a positive focus lines people up for success. My job is to make sure there are solutions and recommendations already in place, coach managers and supervisors, and guide employees through their feelings about how they see themselves and their perception related to how others will see them. Return to work plans are not written in stone, so it's critical to communicate and make sure people feel free to communicate so the plan can be adjusted as needed. Sometimes people don't feel comfortable asking for help or admitting that things are not going well. So I'll ask them in advance for a phrase that is comfortable for them. And they'll come back with something like not catching the ball. So when I hear that, I know support and change is needed. The ownership of a medical condition or disability always remains with the employee. So decisions need to be made with them, not about them. And I always come from a position of holding them able, which is to say, I project confidence that they can do things unless medical evidence says otherwise. That confidence goes a long way. As a CDMP, I don't always get to see the full impact of my work beyond the workplace. Those I've worked with are just trying to get back to their old selves, with their friends and families too. Sometimes I hear sad stories, like I can't lift my kids anymore. And I hear happy stories, like I got back on my hockey skates today. It affects life, not just work. That's why I'm a CDMP. In 2021, there were over 600 Canadian job listings daily in the field of disability management. This is a trend that continues today, driven by developments like the recent return to work obligation under the Workers' Compensation Board legislation in British Columbia. There are a lot of exciting and rewarding career paths in this growing field. I wish someone had been there to guide me when I first graduated from university because I struggled with how to apply my degree in kinesiology to the professional work world. Although my university education had provided me with a number of practical opportunities working in health and safety as well as the rehabilitation field, I wasn't able to obtain the necessary skills to work in disability management, but I always knew I had an interest in it. With some transferable skills under my belt, I got my first disability management job as a case manager with Manulife Financial. Soon after, I was headhunted by a former manager and joined Vancouver Coastal Health. With his support, I earned my CDMP destination in 2013. Three years after that, I applied for and got my current job at the BC Liquor Distribution Branch. One great thing about the CDMP destination is that it is a gold standard that many employers look for when hiring disability management professionals for their organizations. 
The destination certainly has helped me in my career growth and made me stand out amongst other candidates who do not have the same training. I have worked with many different occupational groups in the last 10 years, managing their disability case files. Maintenance staff, retail associates, nurses, physio, and occupational therapists, care aides, postal workers, warehouse and office workers. The CDMP destination opened up a balance of opportunity and financial gain for me. Not only am I able to work at a job that I'm passionate about, I'm grateful for the financial stability and support that this career offers. I'm a mother of three and work mostly from home with a few days in the office to maintain my connection to the team. The CDMP destination led me to a career that has been personally, professionally, and financially rewarding, and it has allowed me to build and support my family. Thank you, Trevor. Very well done, very professional, great messages. So that ends our really full agenda today. I wanna to thank all the speakers uh, today um, and want to congratulate all the graduation uh, graduates today. I wanna to also have a special thanks out to Jennifer and Olivia and Lanny who work behind the scenes to make sure that today happens. So thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we recognize the accomplishments of our fellow disability management professionals and move towards to support each other in this challenging and important work. And again, uh, we look forward to our International Forum on Disability Management Conference next year, 2024, in Vancouver. So look forward to that, and thank everybody, and have a good day.